Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibylla Harold. Welcome to lesson number seven, titled Christ's Victory Over Death. It's ready for teaching on November 12, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that, as we learnt in last week's lesson, Jesus died that each of us could have eternal life. But we realise that that eternal life really required the resurrection of Jesus. And as we study this week about Christ's victory over death, we pray that we will have greater confidence in him, greater confidence in you, and also the excitement that comes with knowing that there is a place for us and that Jesus was willing to come and die and then be resurrected, that each of us could have eternal life. And as we study, we pray your Holy Spirit will be with us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those who are listening on Bribey Island in Australia, for Taminate in Canada, for June from Trinidad and Tobago, for Orinita from St Lucia, from Samuel from the Dominican Republic, from Jock San in New Zealand, for John in Loxley in Alabama, for Sybil in Jamaica, and for Rosilio in Mexico, and for everyone who's listening, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, and may we know Jesus, not just as our Saviour, but as our friend. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and to the place of the dead. Let's read that again, Revelation 1, verses 17 and 19. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man, but he put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and to the place of the dead. Central to the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Paul made this point very powerfully when he wrote, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And that's from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 16 to 18. We will look at this in more detail next week. Thus, no matter all the emphasis Paul put on Christ's death and how important it was, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, it really does us no good apart from his resurrection. That's how crucial the resurrection of Jesus is to the entire Christian faith and the plan of salvation. However, it's hard to understand why the resurrection of Christ and with it our resurrection are so important if, as many believe, the dead in Christ are already enjoying the bliss of heaven as they have gone home to be with the Lord. All that aside, this week we will look at Christ's resurrection and all the convincing evidence he gave us to believe in it. Sunday, November 6, A Sealed Tomb Christ's mission seemed to have ended and even failed with his death on the cross. 
Satan succeeded in instigating Judas to betray the Saviour in Luke 22, verses 3 and 4, which we'll read now. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And it's also recorded in John 13, beginning at verse 26. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. And we read the chief priests and elders demanded his death in Matthew twenty six fifty nine. Now the chief priests, the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. And Matthew twenty seven twenty. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. After Jesus was arrested, all the disciples forsook him and fled, we read in Matthew twenty six fifty six, And Peter denied him three times. As we read in Matthew twenty six sixty nine to 75 Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now Jesus was lying in a tomb, hewed out of a rock, closed with a large and sealed stone, protected by Roman guards, and watched by invisible demonic powers. If we read Matthew 27, verses 57 to 66, Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, We remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Ellen White wrote in Manuscript Releases, Volume 12, page 412, If he could, he, that's Satan, would have held Christ locked in the tomb. End of quote. During his earthly ministry, Christ had foretold not only his death on the cross, but also his resurrection. Using the Eastern inclusive language, in which a fraction of a day stands for a whole day, Jesus mentioned that, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's recorded in Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40. On other occasions, Jesus underscored that he would be killed, but on the third day he would rise again. We read about that in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes 
and be killed and be raised the third day. And Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And Matthew 20, verses 17 to 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. The chief priests and the Pharisees were aware of those statements and took measures that they hoped would prevent his resurrection. Read Matthew twenty-seven sixty-two to 66 How did these actions only help provide the world later with more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? Matthew 27, beginning at verse 62, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. All security measures taken to keep Jesus locked in the tomb only made his victory over death and the hosts of evil even more noticeable because of all the precautions and measures that his enemies took to try to make sure it would never happen. Also, these men surely had heard of the miracles of Jesus. They had seen some of them too. And yet, they thought that a guard over the tomb could stop him, the one who was able to do so many miracles, from being resurrected. Also, they put a guard around the tomb in case of what? That the disciples might steal the body and then claim that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead? When the people would say, where is the risen Jesus, they could say, just take our word for it. If nothing else, their actions revealed just how afraid the chief priests were of Jesus even after he died. Perhaps deep down, they did fear that he just might be resurrected after all. Monday, November 7. He is risen. The victory of Christ over Satan and his evil powers was secured on the cross and confirmed by the empty tomb. From the Desire of Ages, page 782, we read, When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Saviour would not take his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end, and that he must finally die. End of quote. And though Christ's humanity died, his divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. Read Matthew 28, 1-6, John 10, 17-18, and Romans 8, 11. Who was directly involved in the resurrection of Jesus? Matthew 28, 1-6, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. 
and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And John ten seventeen and 18, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. During His ministry in Samaria Perea, Jesus stated that he himself had power to lay down his life and to take it again, as we've just read in John 10. To Martha he said, I am the resurrection of the life, in John 11.25. Other passages speak of his resurrection as an act of God, as Acts 2.24 says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and Hebrews 13 verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Even a mighty angel of the Lord was involved in that glorious event, as we read in Matthew 28, 1 and 2. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Meanwhile, Matthew 28, 11 to 15 reveals the futile and foolish efforts of the leaders to continue fighting against Jesus. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 11. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the high priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. The Roman guard told the leaders all the things that had happened, Matthew 28, 11. Implicit in this account is the idea that the guards saw the resurrection. If not, what would their words mean? An angel came down from heaven, moved the stone, sat on it, and the guards fainted? The next thing that they knew, the tomb was empty. Maybe, while the Romans were unconscious, the angel took away the body of Jesus. Maybe the disciples did, or someone else stole it. Whatever happened, the body of Jesus was obviously gone. An angel from heaven coming down, the men fainting from fear, and the tomb being empty would have been disconcerting enough to the religious leaders. But that they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers in Matthew 28, 12 to keep these men quiet implied that whatever the soldiers told them disturbed them deeply. And what they told of, of course, was the resurrection of Jesus. And so to finish today, some scoff at the idea that the first people to see Christ resurrected were Romans. Why? In what ways is this truth symbolic of what was to come? The gospel going to the Gentiles as well?
Tuesday, November 8. Many arose with him. Matthew twenty seven fifty one to 53 reads, Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What does this incredible account teach us about the resurrection of Jesus and what it accomplished? An earthquake marked the death of Jesus. We've just read in Matthew twenty-seven fifty to 51 And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And another one marked his resurrection in Matthew 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. At the moment Jesus died, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one to 53 from the New International Version. These saints were raised glorified as witnesses of Christ's own resurrection and as prototypes of those who will be raised at the final resurrection. Thus, right after the resurrection of Jesus, many of the Jewish people were given powerful evidence to believe in his resurrection and thus to accept him as their saviour, which many did, including many priests, as we read in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. During his ministry, we read in The Desire of Ages, page 786, Jesus had raised the dead to life. He had raised the son of the widow of Nain and the ruler's daughter and Lazarus. But these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they were still subject to death. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. They ascended with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. These went into the city and appeared unto many, declaring, Christ has risen from the dead, and we are risen with him. Thus was immortalized the sacred truth of the resurrection. End of quote. Humanly speaking, the chief priests and the elders had great advantages. They held the religious power of the nation and were even able to convince the Roman authorities and the crowds to help them with their schemes. But they forgot that, as it says in Daniel 4.32, the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Their lies were contradicted and invalidated by the existence of those resurrected saints. And so to finish the day, no matter how bad things can get now, why can we trust in God's ultimate victory for us as we still struggle in this fallen world? Wednesday, November 9, Witnesses of the Risen Christ Read John chapter 20, verses 11 to 29, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 to 8. How did the disciples react when they first met the risen Christ? John 20, beginning at verse 11, But Mary stood outside by the temple weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one on the, at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. 
Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven from them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 to 8. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain at the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. The two angels at the tomb told Mary Magdalene and some other women that Jesus had risen, as we read in verse 1 of chapter 28 of Matthew. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And then in verse 5, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you, and in Mark 16, verses 1 to 7. Now when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said 
to you. And Luke 24, beginning at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the disciples. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But soon... Jesus himself appeared to them, and they worshipped him, as we read in Matthew 28, 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. In verses 9 and 10, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. He appeared then to Peter, as we read in Luke 24.34. The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And 1 Corinthians 15.5 And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve and to the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, whose hearts were burning while he was speaking to them. We read that in Matthew sixteen twelve. After that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And that's expanded in Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk, and are sad? Then the one, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company, who arrived at the tomb early, astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself." Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, 
Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. When Jesus came into the upper room, the disciples were initially terrified and frightened, but then they were filled with joy and marvelled at what had happened. Luke 24, 33-39 So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathering together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvelled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. And that we read earlier. A week later, Jesus came again into the same room without opening the doors, and then even Thomas believed in his resurrection, as we read in uh, John twenty twenty four to 29 before. During the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at once, we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6, and by James we read about in the following verse, and that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Jesus joined some disciples at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast with them followed by a talk with Peter, as you read in John 21, verses 1 to 23. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you caught any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. 
Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, one hundred and fifty-three, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing this, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? There might have been other appearances of Jesus, as we read in Acts 1 verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God." before the final one at his ascension, which is described in Luke 24, verses 50 to 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. And also Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven." Paul also considered himself an eyewitness to the risen Christ, who appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8. 
Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. And we'll compare that with Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. When the other disciples first told the absent Thomas that they had seen the risen Lord, he reacted by saying in John 20 verse 25, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus reappeared to the disciples, now with Thomas present. Jesus said to him, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. John 20 verse 27. Then Thomas confessed, My Lord and my God. And Jesus answered, Thomas, because you have seen me and have believed, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, in verse 29. And so to finish the day, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Even if you've not seen for yourself the resurrected Christ, what other reasons do you have for your faith in Jesus? Thursday, November 10, The First Fruits of Those Who Have Died Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, in light of Deuteronomy 26, 1-11. In what sense did Paul refer to the risen Christ as the first fruits of those who have died? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then we need to compare this with Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 11. And it shall be, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from your land, that the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide." And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days, and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labour and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. 
Then you shall set it before the Lord your God, and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you, and your house, you and the Levite, and the stranger who is among you. The offering of the first fruits was an ancient Israelite agricultural practice with deep religious significance. It was a sacred recognition of God as the gracious provider who had entrusted his stewards with the land where the crops grew and were ready to be harvested. And we'll look at Exodus chapter 23 verse 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And Exodus 34 and verse 26. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And then Leviticus chapter 2, verses 11 to 16. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. As for the offering of the firstfruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar with a sweet aroma. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. If you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits green heads of grain roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. Then the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of its beaten grain and part of its oil, with all the frankincense as an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then we also refer to Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 11, which we read at the beginning of today's lesson. The first fruits indicated that the harvest was not only starting, but also revealing the quality of its products. According to Wayne Grudem in Systematic Theology, page 615, in calling Christ the firstfruits, in Greek apache, Paul uses a metaphor from agriculture to indicate that we will be like Christ, just as the firstfruits or the first taste of the ripening crop show what the rest of the harvest will be like for that crop, so Christ, as the first fruits, shows what our resurrection bodies will be like when, in God's final harvest, he raises us from the dead and brings us into his presence. End of quote. It is worth remembering that Jesus came out of the grave with a glorified human body, but he was still carrying the marks of the crucifixion. As we read in John 20, in verses 20 and 27. Verse 20 reads, When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And verse 27 says, Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Does this mean that the risen children of God will likewise bear the physical marks of their own sufferings? In the case of the Apostle Paul, will he still carry in his glorified body the thorn in the flesh that he describes in 2 Corinthians 12.7 and the marks of the Lord Jesus in Galatians 6.17? Until his death, Paul, as we read in the story of redemption, page 275, was ever to carry about with him in the body the marks of Christ's glory in his eyes, which had been blinded by the heavenly light, as we read in Acts 9, 1 to 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? 
Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. But this does not mean that he or any other of the glorified redeemed will be raised with the marks of their own suffering. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 54. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. In the case of Christ, the marks of his cruelty, we read in early writings, page 179, he will ever bear. Every print of the nails will tell the story of man's wonderful redemption and the dear price by which it was purchased. End of quote. His marks are what guarantee us that all of ours will be forever gone. And so, to finish the day, Christ will forever bear the scars of his crucifixion. What does that reveal about God's love for us and what it cost to save us? How does it show, too, how much the Godhead has invested in saving us? Friday, November 11. Modern sentiment doesn't allow for something like the resurrection of Jesus. However, the historical evidence is so strong that even those who can't accept the reality of the resurrection are forced to admit that many people believed that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. Thus, much of anti-resurrection apologetics is the attempt to explain what could have caused all these different people to believe that they had seen the risen Christ. Some have argued that all the disciples hallucinated the resurrected Jesus. Others, that Jesus hadn't really died, but only had swooned and then come back to life after he'd been brought down from the cross, and when he had reappeared, his followers thought that he had been raised from the dead. And believe it or not, some have argued that Jesus had a twin brother whom the disciples mistook for the risen Christ. In other words, the historical evidence is so strong for Christ's resurrection that these are the kinds of arguments people concoct in order to try to dismiss it. With the resurrection itself so important, we should not be surprised by all the good reasons we have been given to believe it. In The Desire of Ages, page 787, we read, The voice that cried from the cross, It is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus it will be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Saviour's resurrection, a few graves were opened, but at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious, immortal life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. 
And that brings us to our two discussion questions this week. One, it is finished in John 19.30 and he is risen in Matthew 28.6 are two of the most meaningful statements ever made. How do they complement each other within salvation history? What great hope is found in these words for us? And two, at first the religious leaders wanted guards at the tomb to keep the disciples from stealing the body of Jesus. Later, they paid the guards to say that the disciples did steal the body. How does this account help to reveal the reality of Christ's empty tomb, and why is that empty tomb so important to us as Christians? Welcome to Inside Story. Inside Story this week is again read by Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Accepting the Word, Part 1, by Andrew McChesney. Eulalia Rashid ran out of beer and headed to the store to buy more in the northern Mariana Islands, a US Commonwealth in the Pacific Ocean. It was Christmas Eve. She was lonely and had no one with whom to celebrate the holiday. An alcoholic for 37 years, she had all but abandoned her four children and 13 grandchildren. She also was ill with colon cancer. As Eulalia walked, a small wooden box caught her eye on the ground on the darkened street. She picked it up and shook it, thinking some money might be inside. Sure enough, a penny was inside, and she placed the box in her pocket. Minutes later, standing in the light of the store, she pulled out the box and saw words written on the top. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. From Psalm 119 verse 105. The next morning on Christmas Day, Eulalia read and reread the words on the box. What is this word? she wondered. What is this lamp that is to light my path? Eulalia had always believed in Jesus, but she had never had a relationship with him. Now she tried to translate Psalm 119 verse 105 into her native Tomoro and Palau languages. She looked up the verse in several Bible translations. Still not understanding the words, she decided to read through the entire Bible. Maybe she would find an explanation somewhere. One day she read John chapter 1 verse 1 which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Her eyes lit up with joy. She read on, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, in John 1, verse 14. Here is the answer, she thought. The Word is Jesus. Jesus is the lamp that lights my path. By now, she loved reading the Bible. She kept on reading, and she started to pray regularly. As she read and prayed, her life changed. She read that God had set aside the seventh day as Sabbath in Exodus 20, and she began to keep the Sabbath in her home. She read about clean and unclean foods in Leviticus 11 and modified her diet. When she saw that God gave Adam and Eve a plant-based diet, she cultivated a garden of sweet potatoes, spinach, string beans, eggplant, tomatoes, tapioca, pawpaw, mangoes, lemons, dragon fruit, soursop, mulberries, and coconuts. Her family did not understand what was going on. They were astonished to see that she had stopped drinking. She told them that one day she had simply decided not to drink, and Jesus had taken away her desire for alcohol in the twinkling of an eye. Eulalia didn't know it, but she was already becoming a missionary to her family by her example. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember... God is always faithful.